woman's body found beaten beyond recognition. You sip your coffee, taking a drag of your smoke, turning the page, taking a bite of your toast. Just another day, just another death. Just one more thing for you to forget. You and your soft, sheltered life. Just go on and on. For nobody special from your world is gone. Just another hasting street whore, sentenced to death. No judge, no jury, no trial, no mercy. The judge's gavel already fallen, sentence already passed. Robert William Willie Picton, born on October 26, 1949, hails from Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada. He was once a pig farmer, but his life took a dark turn as he became a notorious serial killer. He was found guilty of the second-degree murders of six women. However, the charges against him extended to the deaths of 20 more women, many of whom were known to be involved in prostitution and drug use in Vancouver's downtown east side. In December 2007, Picton was handed a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. This is the most severe punishment available under Canadian law for the crime of murder. On the first day of the trial, January 22, 2007, it was revealed that Picton had confessed to an undercover police officer, who was pretending to be his cellmate, that he had committed 49 murders. Picton expressed a desire to commit one more murder to round the number to 50. He was eventually apprehended due to his own carelessness, which he referred to as being sloppy. On February 5, 2002, law enforcement officers carried out a search warrant for unauthorized firearms at a property owned by Picton and his three siblings. Picton was detained, and following this, police secured a second warrant to search the farm as part of the BC Missing Women investigation. During this search, they discovered personal belongings, including a prescription asthma inhaler, of one of the missing women. The farm was subsequently cordoned off by a joint task force of the RCMP and Vancouver Police Department. The next day, Picton was charged with several firearms-related offenses, including storing a firearm in violation of regulations, possession of a firearm without a license, and possession of a loaded restricted firearm without a license. He was later released, but remained under police surveillance. Fast forward to Friday, February 22, 2002. Picton was arrested again and faced two counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Serena Abatsway and Mona Wilson. As the investigation progressed, three more charges were added on April 2, 2002, for the murders of Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, and Heather Bottomley. A week later, on April 9, 2002, a sixth charge was filed for the murder of Andrea Josbury, quickly followed by a seventh charge for the murder of Brenda Wolfe. On September 20, 2002, the case against Robert William Willie Picton expanded as he faced four additional charges for the murders of Georgina Papin, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, and Jennifer Firminger. The charges didn't stop there. On October 3, 2002, four more charges were added to his name for the murders of Heather Chinnick, Tanya Holick, Sherry Irving, and Inga Hall. This brought the total charges to 15, marking the investigation as the largest in Canadian history concerning a serial killer. Fast forward to May 26, 2005, 12 more charges were filed against him for the murders of Kara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marnie Frey, Tiffany Drew, Carrie Kosky, Sarah Devries, Cynthia Felix, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick, and an unidentified woman known as Jane Doe. This escalated the total number of first-degree murder charges to 27. The investigation was extensive and costly. Excavations on the property continued until November 2003, with the provincial government estimating the cost of the investigation to be around $70 million by the end of 2003. Today, the property is cordoned off and under a lien by the Crown and Right of British Columbia. In the process, all the buildings on the property were raised. The forensic analysis was challenging due to the state of the victims' bodies, which may have been left to decompose or consumed by insects and pigs on the farm. In the initial stages of the excavations, forensic anthropologists employed heavy machinery, including two 50-foot flat conveyor belts and soil sifters, to uncover any traces of remains. A chilling revelation came to light on March 10, 2004. It was disclosed that human flesh might have been processed and mixed with pork from the farm. This pork was not sold commercially, but was given to friends and visitors of the farm. There were also allegations that he fed the bodies directly to his pigs. 
In 2003, a preliminary investigation was conducted, the details of which were kept confidential until 2010. This investigation revealed that in 1997, a man named Picton was accused of attempting to murder a woman. The woman, who was a sex worker, managed to survive the ordeal and testified at the 2003 investigation. She stated that after being taken to a farm in Port Coquitlam and engaging in sexual activity with Picton, he handcuffed her left hand and stabbed her in the stomach. In self-defense, she also stabbed Picton. Both of them ended up receiving treatment at the same hospital, where the staff used a key found in Picton's possession to unlock the handcuffs on the woman's wrist. The charges against Picton were dropped on January 27, 1998, due to concerns about the woman's drug addiction and the belief that she was too unstable to provide reliable testimony. The attire Picton wore on the night of the incident, including his clothes and rubber boots, were confiscated by the police and stored in an RCMP locker for over seven years. It wasn't until 2004 that lab tests revealed the DNA of two missing women on the items that had been seized from Picton in 1997. Picton's trial began in New Westminster on January 30, 2006. He pleaded not guilty to 27 counts of first-degree murder before the Supreme Court of British Columbia. The first phase of the trial, known as voir dire, took up most of the year and was devoted to determining the admissibility of various pieces of evidence. The media was prohibited from disclosing any information presented during these proceedings. On March 2, 2006, Judge James Williams dismissed one of 27 charges due to insufficient evidence. On August 9, 2006, Judge Williams decided to divide the charges into two groups, one consisting of six charges and the other 20 charges. The hearing continued with the group of six people. The remaining 20 issues could have been addressed in a separate hearing, but were ultimately dismissed on August 4, 2010. Due to the publication ban, Full details of the decision remain secret. However, the judge explained that trying all 26 charges simultaneously would place an undue burden on the jury, potentially leading to a two-year trial and an increased risk of mistrial. The judge also noted that the six charges selected for trial had significantly different evidence compared to the other 20. A significant part of the evidence presented in the fateful phase in 2006 was never revealed to the jury due to the trial judge's decisions. This evidence remained under a publication ban until August 4, 2010. On January 22, 2007, a jury trial began, with Picton facing first-degree murder charges in the deaths of Marnie Frey, Serena Abotswe, Georgina Papin, Andrea Josbury, Brenda Wolfe, and Mona Wilson. With the lifting of the media ban, details uncovered during the extensive investigation were finally made public. In his opening statement, Crown Counsel Daryl Privet described evidence found on Picton's property, which placed hands and feet inside bisected skulls. Another victim's remains were found in a garbage bag under a dumpster, and her blood-soaked clothing was found in the trailer where Picton lived. Part of a victim's jawbone and teeth were unearthed next to the slaughterhouse, and a 22 caliber gun attached to a sex toy containing both Picton's and the victim's DNA was placed in her laundry room. In video footage shown to the jury, Picton claimed he used the sex toy as an improvised silencer for his gun. As of February 20, 2007, the court was presented with the following details. Inside Picton's trailer, the police discovered a loaded 22 revolver with an unusually large spiky black object of Hindu origin attached to the barrel. One round had been discharged from the weapon. Other items found included boxes of 357 Magnum ammunition night vision goggles, two sets of handcuffs lined with faux fur, a syringe containing three milliliters of a blue liquid, and an aphrodisiac known as Spanish fly. A videotape was shown featuring Scott Chubb, a friend of Picton's, in which Chubb claimed that Picton had suggested a method for killing a female heroin addict by injecting her with windshield washer fluid. A second tape was played, this one featuring an associate named Andrew Bellwood. Bellwood claimed that Picton had discussed killing sex workers by handcuffing and strangling them, then draining their blood and gutting them before feeding their remains to pigs. In October 2007, a juror was accused of having prematurely concluded that Picton was innocent. The trial judge questioned the juror, who was reported to have stated that based on what she had seen, she was certain that Picton was innocent and that the authorities had apprehended the wrong individual. 
the juror vehemently denied these allegations. Justice Williams decided that she could remain on the jury as it had not been conclusively proven that she had made the statements. On December 6, 2007, Justice James Williams halted jury deliberations after identifying an error in his instructions to the jury. Earlier that day, the jury had submitted a written question to Justice James, seeking clarification on his instructions and asking, are we able to say yes if we infer the accused acted indirectly? On December 9, 2007, the jury delivered a verdict. Picton was found not guilty on six counts of first-degree murder, but was found guilty on six counts of second-degree murder. A conviction of second-degree murder carries a sentence of life imprisonment, with no possibility of parole for a period ranging from 10 to 25 years, as determined by the trial judge. On December 11, 2007, after reviewing 18 victim impact statements, Justice James Williams of the British Columbia Supreme Court sentenced Picton to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 25 years. This is the maximum penalty for second-degree murder and is equivalent to the sentence that would have been imposed for a conviction of first-degree murder. In delivering the sentence, Justice Williams stated, Mr. Picton's actions were murderous and repeatedly so. I may not know the specifics, but this much I do know. What happened to the victims was senseless and despicable. Now in this video, you can watch him confess to 49 murders to an undercover police officer posing as his cellmate. You can see Picton telling the officer that he wanted to kill another woman to get his score up to 50, and that he got caught because he was sloppy. Oh, shit, eh? Well, they had a fucking furnace, you know? 
pissing me off. Fucking horrible. You know, pissing me right off. I should have come to this. Hear this? They don't have nothing but nothing at the last.